jump in you, you sure. know I, I first heard of you when i heard the record swimming and uh second oh, yeah. communion I, yes. I love i love that stuff and then i started to explore you know what you did and uh like right. the the 80s the early 80s kind of ornettish records i love those yeah. still great the the yeah. otter that the, the melody of the otter oh, yeah that song yeah. Whew, i love that and uh but I, I wanted to start just you play the french horn which is like such an uh underrated instrument in jazz, I would say. I mean, mm -hmm. why the decision first to, to, how did you come up with the French horn? What was your story there? And I, I know that you studied with like the John Coltrane of French horn, Julius Watkins. So kind of how did all this come together? I mean, if you, we can start um, with this super. Um, but um, <laughs> before I get into the French horn, Here's a funny story, since we both love Tony Malaby. Yeah. And he comes out with these beautiful sayings sometimes that you remember for the rest of your life. And I could tell some other ones about that. But um, we were in a rehearsal with the great, in the studio of Neil Kirkwood. And I think it was with Tom Rainey. And he had, Neil Kirkwood had this old strange kind of phone system in this old building on 42nd Street. And I couldn't figure out, if you push this button, this phone works, or this phone works, this phone works. <laughs> And I laughed and I said, oh, I'm not made for these certain times. And Tony said, yeah, Tom, I kind of think of you as an old Wild West kind of guy. <laughs> and then we all, like, yeah, we all just cracked up. Oh, man. <laughs> and then Tony had some other good ones, too, that I can get into later. Oh, man, uh, yeah, please. I should, make I a, I should put them up on the wall. Tony Malaby-isms. Not, no, we should make a Facebook group. Yeah, <laughs> our favorite sayings. Share like all, all the musicians who played with Tony should should join yeah. and like share this stuff. You know. <laughs> so, um, anyway, yes, I was in in New Jersey, New Jersey, mm -hmm. USA, public schools. You could have the opportunity to play music in the school band in literally fourth grade. So you were going to be like nine or so. So at the end of third grade, they had a list of little pictures of instruments. And I thought to myself, I would probably play the trumpet and, um, or maybe the trombone. And then I saw this picture. I was like, well, wait a minute, what's that? And I remember something from like a kid's guide to the orchestra LP we had from e years even earlier. And I think, I think I know that one. And that one's kind of cool. What about that one? And they said, oh, you have to have good ears if you want to play that. And they did these little tests. Ba-bum, 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 ba-bum. Does it go up? Does it go down? Does it go up? Does it go down? What about, did it? Goes up. They go, okay, kid, you can play. You, you aced it. You can play the French horn. Oh, okay. um, and I was just, I liked it. And um, then fast forward to a little bit later, I was kind of into classical music because that was what the French yeah, horn sure. did. And then um, fast forward a little bit later, and I thought, well, I'm, my friends were really into jazz. Now we're talking high school, like age uh, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade. Um, then everybody was into Mahavishnu. Oh, yeah, and, it's like early 70s, yeah. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah. B uh, Bitches Brew, um, Live Evil, Electric Miles, Mahavishnu, Chikoria. And then... And then everybody was like learning more about earlier Miles and Clifford Brown and then Ornette Coleman. So by the time I was 11th grade, 12th grade, I was like, this is what I really want to do, but I don't know if it's possible with this instrument. Um, and then I did the, the, the Coltrane of French horn. Uh, I found out about Julius Watkins and then I realized, oh, maybe I can do this too. Um, we're very, you know, at age basically 17. Oh, I think, wow. When I, when oh, I heard wow. his recordings with Monk from yeah. a next door neighbor that just happened to have it. And, um, um, and kind of just like went 
went from there. Then I found out there there were others, not a lot, but there were others. There was John Clark. Yeah. Sure. And then before too long, I found out about Vincent Chancy. Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and um, um, so I just kind of like, okay, I'm going to try to figure this out. It's there's no easy path, but for the, then the next four years, um, two years at one college, two years at a different college. Those last two years were at New England Conservatory, mm, and they let oh, me okay. be a normal quote unquote jazz major, whatever that meant, and um, apply the things that the other students were all doing, but to my instrument, the French horn. And there was Jimmy Jufri and George Russell and yeah. Rand Blake and um, and especially Jackie Bayard. Oh, I, they were all oh. there, though those um, now we're talking we've we've moved from the early 70s to the late 70s and I finished in 79 um, there with mm. private lessons in classical horn still for like technique and stuff yeah sure and and Jackie Bayard I, I shared those, the, those how, how, was it with Jack? how was it with Jackie Oh, he was so great. He he was so open and just like, yeah, man, you do whatever you want, man. That's great. Just go, go. No, think about this. Think about that. Okay, play this over this chord. Um, you you hear what you hear what this is? You know, like sharp nine, flat nine, sharp nine, flat nine. He's like, that's what everybody's doing. Um, once you understand that, when you hear the flat nine, sharp nine, over and over and over, <clears throat> over a five chord, you go. Oh, that's what everybody's doing. <laughs> and then you just work it and work it and work it. <clears throat> so that was like this wonderful revelation. I think many people that studied with Jackie, Jackie. might have this similar kind of memory, whether Marty Ehrlich, Michael Moore, Jeremy Kahn, who's a great classical, uh, great jazz pianist in, in the Chicago area. I'm thinking there are many of us that love Jackie. And then a lot of the people at that time played in Jackie's... Um, yeah big band and i did occasionally i would be like a pretend french horn and um that was always really fun too so that was my sort of journey i just like fell in oh, love wow. with the music when i was you know 15 16 17 and then around 17 i realized oh maybe i can do this too hmm. and i've just never stopped basically yeah those sure. first years were, yeah. were not were not as as many of the people that you have interviewed we all had to do or almost all of us had to do day jobs in one way or another in the 80s especially and yeah. even in the early 90s and then many of us in that generation not all then once it was the well eight, 80s even 80s i would be coming over to europe i might have to do a day job in new york and um, do a save tour up some in money europe, or... and go do a tour in europe make some money come home Sort of, we all, so many of us did that, cobble that together. Yeah. Um, I'd play in in, ha in Amsterdam and then other little towns all over Holland. Oh, really? Oh. Be Belgium and even Berlin. I think we went all the way over to Berlin. And you as a band leader already? Like, yes. Oh, yes. Really? When was that? When After was the first those time? first two came out, like motion stillness. <clears throat> you and, and, yeah. Yeah. Motion stillness. And you go back to the very first one was the one the called Tom Varner Quartet. Yeah. I love this. Yeah. So that one came, I recorded in literally a year after college, like August 1980. So you were like then, 23 or? Yeah. Oh, wow, man. That's crazy. Wow. I was crazy. I met Fred Hopkins on the subway, the great bass player. And yeah, I, I wanted to ask you how the band talking. happened because the band is killing. I mean, it's like... Yeah. Well, Ed Jackson was my dear, good friend who was also a classmate at New England Conservatory. So he, oh. he and we had a really nice um sound the two, the alto and the horn together and a great understanding and then i thought well here i am in new york i don't have a steady rhythm section why don't i just ask some people and just see and um i had met fred i had met i had met fred at like a club maybe just saying hi here and there i had met billy hart at a club maybe saying hi here and there mm, okay. and then i i ran into fred on the subway <laughs> and again i said hi i saw you at maybe the 10 palace a month ago yeah man and he, he was the most friendly most wonderful guy <clears throat> we just talked and talked and talked and i said at the very end of the conversation i had to get out i said this is crazy but would you be interested in <clears throat> 
if I'm going to do a recording to consider being on this recording, he said, yeah, man, sure. You call me, call me. And later he said, I, this kid's not going to call me. And I was like, <laughs> thank you. And, um, and when I was able to tell, and he said, yes. And when I was able to tell Billy Hart, Hey, Billy Hart, Fred Hopkins is going to, Fred's going to be on this record. Okay. Well, Fred's going to be on that. record. Okay. I'll do it too. That's how this <laughs> and, um, that was August, um, nine, August of 1980, oh, right? Wow. So then two years later, March of 82, I recorded live um, Motion Stillness, which was also with Billy. But yeah. by then, um, um, Ed Schuller, the bass player, was the bass bassist. But it was still, it was still um, oh. um, um, Ed Jackson. And then on that record, Billy Hart was so busy. This was so typical of him. And to this day. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, he's, he's, he's said, amazing. Okay, I can record a set before the gig that we're going to just record it live in the room. And I can record the first set. But for your second set, I have to go do another gig. I'm like, okay, <laughs> that's fine. And then we got Adam Nussbaum to play yeah. the second gig. Second set of that performance. Um, which, which when I think back, is pretty funny. Um, and um, so that was, now that brings us to 82. And then, um, um, so I just kept going from there, you know. So you basically had like two records and with those two records, you already went to Europe or? Yes. How, how yeah. do you organize yeah. a tour back then? I mean, like, well, like now it's easy, <laughs> easy kind of. Yeah, it was not, it was not easy. There's a guy in Amsterdam, he was helping other, other groups. He was helping um, the, your, no. 29th Street Sax Quartet. Mm. He was helping the Your Neighborhood Sax Quartet, which was with Alan Chase. Um, he was helping, he earlier was helping um, crazy, wonderful Keisha von Maslach. I don't know if you know yeah, him. Yeah, Kenny, sure. Kenny Millions, the crazy sure. Kenny Millions. Sure. Keisha von gave me the connection to this guy named George Coppens, who made a couple, uh, who put out some records. So George would help me and I would say, okay, I'm going to bring Ed Jackson but then oh, we wow. played with Michael Vatcher sometimes. Who oh, was already really? there. Oh, wow. And um, Arnold Doyavird, who was a general know. freelance Amsterdam solid bass player. So we would still play just two horns, bass, and drums, sometimes oh. with Michael. And then sometimes um, I would bring Bobby Previtt. Oh, so it would be oh, Ed Jackson, okay. Bobby Previtt, me, because Bobby was already a friend and we already were playing in each other's groups yeah. i think by then and um so bobby would come and we would play uh, I would, ed jackson bobby arnold wow. and myself and we'd wow. you know we did gigs in in um you know amsterdam but then george would send us you know we did some in um scotland no gigs in Eng no gigs in london but wow. we figured out a way we got had a gig in edinburgh and glasgow, glasgow. yeah <laughs> in wow. berlin and lots of little towns in Belgium too, Mons, yeah. I can remember, um, and lots of little towns and um, in Holland. I think in those days there was budgets. There was probably some kind of, um, you know, state funding. So a little club might have the funding to give us um, a little bit of extra money, so they wouldn't necessarily lose money. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes it would just be like they'd make money and we would, we would get the mo get money. Um, <clears throat> they were not, it was not glamorous, you know, no, no, sure, but, but as you know, as everybody knows, but, um, and sometimes we'd stay on people's couches. Sometimes they could shell out for a really cheapo hotel. So this is the early, this is, oh. I did it 82, 83, 84, 85. That was a lot of those things. Oh. By the later eighties, I started to make more connections in, um, Vienna, <clears throat> even there was, uh, um, uh, and, um, and Switzerland and through, I played in the George Gruntz big band. Oh yeah, exactly. <clears throat> and through that, I met a lot of the more local freer players in Switzerland. And so I started to make a lot of connections there. So in the late eighties and a lot in the nineties, I would play in these various groups that would be two Americans, yeah, yeah. Um, French and Italian and three Swiss, you know, um, 
with various people from the Swiss scene, actually. But later, that's I played, how the Steve Lacey thing happened, probably. Or Steve Lacey, I met the Vespers project earlier. Thing. Yes, that was a little later, but not a lot later. I worked with Steve Lacey in 93, yeah, actually. Yeah. So, yes, it's all kind of together with that. Mm. Um, um, we had met at a workshop in 79 and then oh, I, wow. was, I was a bit of a pest. I would bring him my first LP, that first LP with the Otter and 1212 and Radiator um, when he was visiting in 80, well, no, it would have been 82, 81 maybe. Um, and then we, I'd say hi. And I think he had this Vespers project and it all worked out. He realized that Tom on French horn, that would work. So so he just out of the blue called me and said hey you want to do this thing uh -huh. i was like yes yes and um so his, it was his regular group plus yeah ricky it was jean jacques ford. and yeah 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 ricky ford and myself jean jacques and john betch and john betch um, yeah, uh, yeah and um um may he rest in peace the great um um the great pianist from um from cleveland who all of a sudden bobby few bobby yeah. few too was in there so um and that was a great experience. So that was summer of 93. But then he, he had other projects with a, groups that were similar into that, like an octet type of thing mm. that I did in maybe 94, 95, 96, something like that. Wow. So, so through those years, 80, 90, um, oh, oh, early 00s, just A, making my own projects and doing my own gigs and doing my own recordings, but B, playing in these various mix and match groups um another one was the vienna orchestra vienna art orchestra and there was a trumpet player who was from slovenia in that he was very good and now i can't remember his name i can oh. look it up T tony you know, Anstra. Need... Anstra? no no trumpet a trumpet player from... trumpet player was very literary he was like telling me about you know bulgakov and things like that um um, oh man! No. You know what? Give me ten seconds. Yeah, it's please. Right. Uh, uh, really? Oh no! I know who he is. Well, uh, Ugrin. I know who you mean. No, I don't want to. I don't want to waste our time. Uh, Peter <laughs> Green. Peter Green. Peter Green. That doesn't sound right either. No? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, we'll anyway. look. We'll look it up. We we'll can, look you it can up. do a yeah. postscript. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, Artistry and rhythm recorded in spring two thousand. Okay, I'll, I'll check. Wow. Um, and um, and I, well. Yes, I'll look it up. I'll, I'll anyway, let you know. Yeah, we'll, we'll, cool we'll guy. Check. Um, so just those crazy, those interesting Connection. mixes of, yeah. of people. So that's that's what I've been doing. And, and then all through that time, or from the late 70s and 80s, like a lot of people, like say perhaps Tony and other people, and mm -hmm. a lot of people in our generation, we're all working on our kind of, playing on changes straight ahead jazz yeah. Yeah. abilities but doing it in interesting ways and our free playing oh, and being able to read and being able to um fit in into other any kind of interesting situation where they might need improvising and to read not as not like a great classical reader but but still be able to, sure. to produce the music that people have written um and improvise in a more free way <clears throat> and and always sort of all of the above yeah. basically um, yeah but uh, i wanted to ask you about this uh, uh, early 80s in, in new york mm. you know i keep hearing about you know tim burn told me things and all these players i played with it for the bobby told me private how it was the scene yeah. but how what was it for you like a guy with a french horn fitting into that scene how, how did you like make a name did you go to sessions or make these connections how did that happen yeah um I did. I just kind of like tried my best to say, hey, I know you might think it's crazy that I'm playing this French horn, but I don't. And here we and here I am. And people then would go, cool, man. You know, um, because 
yes, it was sort of a little odd, but I already, I had known, I knew people um, and very quickly I had met Bobby Previtt yeah. in 82, maybe. And I was already yeah. playing in quotes more straight ahead. I was playing in Dave Liebman had a um, sextet. He, oh, really? he had a, he had a group with me, um, Bill Evans, the sax player on tenor. Really? And, um, <laughs> and wow. Dave and um, piano, bass, and drums, and that was a wow. really interesting group. So he he wanted to expand writing for three winds and piano, bass, and drums, wow. and that's where I met Bobby Previtt. He came to that gig. <clears throat> um, so it was always this mix of, but then I was very interested in the in the downtown thing. So um, I knew about John Zorn. You know, in those days, there was this funny record store called the Soho Music Gallery, and John Zorn worked there. So you'd uh -huh. go in, and, you, and it was more like small town America. He go, "Hi, how are you?" And then if you're walking around in that area, John Zorn would be zooming by on his bike, and he'd go, "Hi, hi," on his bicycle, going back to the East Village. You know, <laughs> and there was like no cars in the street because it was pretty. It wasn't the Soho that later became Soho, although it was very quickly it was in some ways. So I was up on 86 and Broadway, where then uh, Bobby Previtt was at times too. Um, and Tim, I remember I would go and meet Tim Byrne and we would like hang out and it, at, for a while. Tim was in what's now called downtown Brooklyn. Um, and, and as was um, Tom Rainey in this crazy oh, yeah. building. I don't know if you talked about the crazy building with um, Kenny Werner. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Michael Bosch and I would I called it the little house on the prairie it was like this one <laughs> last brownstone everything was and now I think that's like giant brownstones and where the professional basketball team plays and it's just like yeah. a totally totally different place um, but Sorry. a lot of those folks I would meet and talk um, and get together with and Tim and I would compare notes because he would make his he made his first record or first couple of records. No, I should correct myself. He made some of his first records as his own personal producer. Yeah, his, that's amazing. Yeah. But then he yeah. would also put some out on Soul Note. Yeah. Bon, Bonandrini. So we would compare notes about having to deal with Bonandrini <laughs> and laugh of the ups and downs. Um, and although we were very happy that sure. Bonandrini would take it and put it out, um, it was also. Tim made a record that was also with Ed Schuller. Schuller, yeah. And yeah. with Paul Motion. Yeah, I loved it. And he, yeah. I think Tim just sort of said, Paul, I don't know if you know me, but I really love your playing and I'd like you to play play on this. And um, and I and I remember asking Tim, what what was the drum part? What did you tell Paul Motion to do? And he just kind of said, I just showed him what everybody else is doing and said, Paul, you do whatever you want to do. To, yeah. that you think is the right thing to do with this and i was like oh right it's not that difficult <laughs> if you got paul motion for that matter tom rainey i never yeah. wrote a drum yeah. no I never wrote a real drum part unless there was really something specific that i truly want some little wood blocks here i know there's yeah. a couple of pieces. wood blocks here one little swoosh of a brush on a snare here um other than that yeah no but I remember being impressed, just like I asked Billy Hart and, and, and say, Fred Hopkins is on it. Tim would just say, what's the harm? You just ask somebody like Paul Motion. Hey, you want to play on my record? And Paul yeah. was like, sure, you know? Back then, I uh, guess, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> that was those days. It was, I wonder if it changed. I don't know. The What's interesting is like, of course, we all start to... Um, create relationships with the people that are our friends that we're playing with more and more. Yeah. So after, um, and those people, well, sadly, Fred Hopkins died um, not too long after that, but even Fred was like really busy with different things as was Billy. And after a while you start to realize, well, 
it makes a lot more sense for me to use my buddy, Bobby yeah. Previtt, you know, or um, people that you know that you're working with and you're creating um, creating this community with yeah. in, in music. So, um, but I still love when generations get mixed up, like, um, um, well, Tim, I know at least on one record, I think he had his mentor and teacher, Julius Hemphill. Julius, right? yeah, 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 yeah. And, or um, Bobby Previtt in more recent years has this, had this project with um, Jamie Saft and- Steve Swallow. Um, yes, but with what? a special, okay. yeah, Steve Swallow. That's Steve, a very yeah. good point because he's older, but then a very special guest on vocal. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Iggy Pop. Iggy Pop, yeah. yeah Hilarious. Exactly. So, exactly. so yeah. that's that's an interesting um, mix of generations. But I also love um, Joe Lovano. Yeah, Hank Jones, used, man. That's... Hank Jones. Those duos. Oof, that's oh, incredible. I love right? those duos. That's and incredible. And then it would, some of them would be, oh, sad to know, to realize now all three have, have now died. Hank Jones, George Moraz, and Paul Motion yeah. on those records where um, um, Joe Lovano would play exactly. uh, basically standards or variations of standards. Yeah. That version of Stella is so, I love that version of Stella. Yeah, so much. It's, it's, yeah it's such beautiful playing. Also by Joe, yeah. man, it's like yes. the yes. lines he plays. It's just yes. like, so, you know. So that one, um, it's nice to have mixes of your group with your friends and things that you've been working on and then do a side project maybe that's um intergenerational or yeah. something different and i remember even talking about that consciously maybe with tim and maybe with other folks uh, at times like do your do your special band maybe do another one then do something totally different yeah. And then get back, you know, yeah. if you're making, a, say, a series of f four CDs over a span of six years, you know. Um, and in those days, we tried. And again, good old Bobby Previtt, who's who was such a good friend, he would get on my case. He said, you got to make your next CD. How long yeah. has it been? Two years, three years? You got to make your next CD. And like, OK, you're right, Bobby. You're <laughs> absolutely right. <laughs> so that was that was more late. That was more like early and mid nineties when I realized um, you got to keep putting things out. You can't, yeah. you can't be super proud of what you did and then let it go for the next 10 years. You got to like, okay, three years later, two years later, keep, yeah. keep moving. Um, but so I, I, yeah. I wanted to ask you about this, this, like you mentioned this, like what Tim told you, what was this like the project that you did playing Bud Powell and kind of Parker, uh, with Kenny Bear, was that like this kind of your idea of this, it like was, Victor Lewis and it, that? Not really. That was kind of like I thought. Okay, I did my more kind of two records that are a little bit more ornate. And yeah, I, I love those. Those, those are man. Those are as, as fresh as ever. Still, I mean, yes, really, I'm. I'm very really. happy with this. Yeah. Then I thought to myself, maybe it was a little bit of like the Young Lions stuff out there. But I was also like, you know what? It'll bug me if I never do it. So I'm going to do, make the absolute best straight ahead jazz record I can possibly make. Um, maybe it'll be good. Maybe it won't. I don't know. But That's I'm going to yeah. like, go yeah. for it. And then maybe I'll kind of get it out of my system. And then I can do any crazy thing I want. And it was kind of worked that way. I kind of thought, okay, um, I've been working on this material for quite a while now. Um, why don't I just do that? And then they were, Mike Richmond, the great bass player, yeah. he was a friend. Um, I had already met Victor Lewis and different things, maybe through Bobby Previtt, uh, no, um, Bobby Watson, the great oh, yeah. alto player. Yeah. And, um, oh, I know, because Ed Jackson couldn't make a tour in Europe, I used Jim Snydero on a tour in Europe. So oh, it wasn't wow. like I thought, I need this straight ahead jazz, a more straight ahead player. It was like he was already working with me on one of those trips to Amsterdam. And so I thought, well, if he did that for practically free, I'll have him. <laughs> this is the pay. His pay is that he gets to be on this record. record. <laughs> um, 
And then um, Kenny Barron, I did just ask. I think I just said, but again, Mike Richmond's on it. And um, Victor, Victor Lewis yeah. is on it. He's like, okay, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> um, and I think we had one rehearsal and, and that was that. But I was, you know, in those days when you're, I was like 28, you know, when you're 28, you're just like, yeah, I'm yeah. going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to, and, and there was no internet. There was no distractions. There was no this, there was no that. So you could just like um, put a hundred percent into, into yeah. it. So, so I did that. And then I think it was kind of like, now I can do whatever I want. The one that I think of that was a side project is maybe you don't even know about this one. It was called um, American songs. Yeah. Um, the new yeah. world record. So yeah. that one was more. Um, okay. I want to do something different. I want to just make a, a, a recording of a variety of songs where the French horn is sort of in the center, but with various guests, but there are songs that go from like 17, 70 to yeah, um, yeah. to the 90s you know or something and um so i did a tammy wynette a george jones a bruce springsteen a gershwin um mahalia jackson um what else did i do um um civil war songs i did like grunge punk civil war songs with pete, <laughs> pete mccann yeah i love pete, george man. Shore. yeah, yeah so I love pete. that was um a really i was very happy about that as this sort of side project mm. um i kind of miss the americana boat <laughs> it was a little too early <laughs> and yeah. i didn't just like push it um but um i i'm thinking you know i could now that it's been since 8 97 98 maybe it's time to revisit some of the, some of that material yeah what, you know so, well, c come on, you, you're in the no, oh no, shit, Frizzell is back in New York. Uh, yeah. Right, I know. I would. I, I, I was would just about to say, like, Seattle. You know. I thought yeah. of that. We did play some little tiny oh, things. Really? Like, um, it was oh, Wayne wow. Wayne Horvitz? Yeah. of course, is in Seattle. He moved. Wayne and Bill, they kind of like when I found when I did move to Seattle, I was like, well, they did it. They had kids. They survived. They're happy um after 24 years in new york i thought okay i can do it and my wife was a seattle native um, and she was thinking of let's go back at that point i had a baby girl on a backpack and a baby <laughs> and a little boy in a stroller and you're trying to get them both onto the subway and go up and yeah, down come on. Yeah. And by that point um and in the snow <laughs> By that point, on the 125th Street subway stop, where you have to walk up like five flights, <laughs> then I was like, my wife was like, now, honey? Like, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. I can move to Seattle now. <laughs> so it's been good. But I remember I'd run into Bill um, in different things um, in Seattle. And Wayne, who had been here earlier, had... Um, helped with some partners create this wonderful club called the yeah. Royal Room, which yeah. is still going, thank God. Um, it survived through, I think, the work of angels, um, COVID. And, um, but he did a special project where it was um, a tribute to Woody Guthrie. And I, we were able to, I was able to play a little duo of um, oh, wow. yeah. Good Night Irene with bill and then oh, wow. Wow. Came in. that was that was a nice a nice little moment that's actually on a youtube somewhere oh man i have to check this look out. it up okay. for you oh please um, I'd love so, to check that. Um, but i knew bill even before all those folks because when i was in boston when i had transferred over to new england conservatory i was i would play as a guest in bands that were at berkeley and one of them was a, a big band that was led by the great um, composer, arranger, Michael Gibbs. Yeah, yeah. And Michael Gibbs' band was with both Bill and Kermit. And oh, some other man. people who became quite well known. The, the, the German sax player named Oliver Peters. Do you know that name? Oliver was, Peters? No, I know him. I think. Um, oh, okay. Um, 
But I know Mike gives his music quite well. I mean, right. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And there was another, to give it, I love this story, that there was another guitar player who was already working and playing around town named Randy Roos, who was very good. Um, and Bill was like guitar too. Randy Roos got the solos. Randy Roos was oh, the wow. big guitar. And years later, I remember I, it was such a perfect illustration of Bill's personality. I said, Bill, remember that time? And they made, they let Randy Roos get all the solos and you, and he said, Randy Roos was really, really good. I'm like, okay, <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Michael Gibbs was right to do that. <clears throat> so, so I already knew Bill from 70, wow. 77, 78, 79. Yeah. Um, and so we might have then when I moved to New York in 79, ran into him when he came back from Belgium, maybe in yeah. 80, 81, I already knew, knew him and we could, um, I think we did some sessions together at some mm. friends' place or there was something. Um, I can't quite remember, but um, um, we would run into each other. And then he moved to Seattle, but not for a while. I think they were, he was in, he was in like Hoboken. Yeah. Okay. Uh, with it, with the wife and the little baby who's now um, Monica, who's yeah. like somebody probably in there. Monica's maybe 40. I have no, I don't know. When yeah, you think probably. Of, yeah, probably. Add it up. Uh, a successful photographer. Yeah. So. Bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. That would be a, a nice combo. You, you, your friend's horn and Bill's guitar man. Yeah. Like, yeah I'd like to do. <laughs> Bill, if you ever see this, thanks. okay. <laughs> yeah, no, but, uh, but Tom, I wanted to ask you also about your swimming group, the the one that mm. kind of got got me excited about your music and composing. And uh, how did that band happen? I mean, it's it's Tom and Cameron, and you know you have Steve oh, yeah. and Tony, which is yeah. a very unusual uh, sax. I don't right. think those guys ever played. The, maybe they did. Yeah, but like, they very, very much different. respected each other. It's true. They really liked each other and respected each other. But I don't know if they ever played together so much. But I, at that point, I was looking for different things to do. I was shifting. The record before that was one called Martian Heartache. And then yeah, on that yeah. one, I wanted to try a different tenor player. I tried it with Ellery, which was wonderful and ed jackson and then i was thinking you know i want to do i just want to change it up i um but i think i asked ellery could you be on this next one and, and he said tom i am so busy my plate is so full I'm, I'm traveling everywhere you know my first suggestion would be try t tony and i thought hmm, that's a great because i already knew tony had played with him in a couple of things so i thought that would be good and then um I knew Steve Wilson through various friends and I, and he was just like, absolutely. Yes. I'd love to do that. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then I knew Cameron from, I'm trying to think, how did I, I knew Cameron through many, many mutual friends too. Um, going back to those days in Amsterdam too. Um, and we'd run into each other and I'm thinking I must've played with him before that, but, um, maybe just sessions or gigs. Yeah. Um, and um, um, and then I already had Tom. I knew I wanted to keep Tom in that, in that yeah, mix, yeah. um, who's one of my favorite drummers ever. Because yeah, he can lay it down, but then it's so kind of free at the same time. But then when he needs to lay it down, he lays it down. And yeah, then it's a, so yeah. loose, loose, well, yeah. Like the Mark Elias group, open loose, Man. open loose, but with a if he needs to. <laughs> my my first whip. record, my first record in New York. I didn't know they those guys played together, right? Uh -huh. and, like as an open loose trio, and I, I I I called. I think I knew Tony, and I called Tony, and then he kind of hooked me up with Elias, and then like, well, who's for drums for Rainy? Okay, right. and we did like quite heavy, like this kind of your style, odd uh -huh. meters, but open right. sessions, compositions in two yeah. hours in systems too. The, everything was first take, and I was just like, <laughs> you know. Uh, you had a built-in band. This was yeah. a recording session of your own? Yeah, yeah, like two hours for Fresh Sound. We did it, and it was just uh, like, it was in two yeah. hours. I was like, last 11 to you, like, uh, yeah. Wow, they're like, okay, it, what's man. next? Okay, next. I have okay, to send next. you this one. You, you, Got it. You're... It's like, it's really like, yeah. man, 
well, yeah and we're when they're the first. right people yeah when, when they're the right people pants, yeah man. it's crazy Tom is yeah. like yeah anyway I was very happy I remember in the recording for swimming we had a lot of material to, yeah. to, to get through and in two days we had we had it all I also had I like to have like I did on the mystery of compassion and then on that one the the virtuoso violin player Mark Feldman. Yeah, how, how did that happen? Oh. Yeah, how did that story happen well, to Mark? Him, actually, I knew him in various settings. I knew him from way back in uh, the Walter Thompson um, ensembles, where Walter would conduct very very similar to Butch Morris. Mm -hmm. He would have these um, a system of cues, and I and I knew um, Mark from way from way back in those situations, and then I'm. Um, trying to think other things i can't remember we did just some improvising together um and i thought ooh, i want to do um you know my regular band but one track will be this special thing where i have like a little mini concerto for mark as yeah. like a little side side note to the to the arc of the of the cd and so i thought that was i was so happy with that in Myst mystery of compassion it was that um i wanted to do yet another one even e uh, yeah. similar but in little miniatures i called it seven miniatures for mark feldman so each one was like one to two minutes but there was um six or seven of them yeah. and and he was happy to do it i mean it was like yeah that would be that would be fun and um i'm really pleased to this day and yeah. and now fast forward to the future <laughs> I'm in Seattle and I might be teaching and there might be a talented violin player in a student group. I say, Hey, this one little, one of those, I think we should do as a little part of a concert. And they're like, yeah. So I'd, I'd get out those little charts and, um, oh, wow. student, the student improvising violin player would might, might, um, take the Mark Feldman chair and it's just one of them maybe and then we would go on to yeah, something yeah. else that's beautiful so yeah. as, as a little interlude kind of um so for swimming i think i just i also thought of those the two soul notes and then swimming there was mystery of compassion martian heartache martian, yeah. swimming was kind of this big trilogy kind trilogy of. Yeah. kind of and then i wasn't sure what to do <laughs> after that then um um, then I did the the Don Cherry project. Yeah, the second yeah. movie. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, um, but those were some definitely stretching out concepts in some of the um, compositions. I know in yeah, Martian I Heartache was like, wow. And they were game. We did, <laughs> the two saxes were doing a Charles <laughs> Ives kind of thing of their own. And then stopping and starting underneath that drew grass tom and me we would play very set um um cole porter's it's all right with me the changes yeah. but and then stop and start and stop and start and the saxes were in this other world yeah, and, yeah. and um it's weird. I, even even to me, it's weird, but I love it. And then yeah. um, um, maybe it was just the time, the, the feeling, the time of the times, you know. And then it would go <laughs> into something else. But they but they were able to execute exactly what I wanted, even yeah. though it was so weird. <laughs> and um, there were some other parts in swimming that had some of those feelings. Some of them were they're over changes though. Or as you know, you, there's a set of changes or there's a set of a very strict um, kind of obstacle course that they yeah. have to um, maneuver over. And yet, and um, so there's definitely definitely some strict structures going on, but then they have to jump and do backflips over them. How, um, how did you do that? Uh, I mean, in general, how, how do you get ideas for, let's say for those projects? How, how did you approach that? You were like, okay, I will do this why and how yeah. I mean, let's put it like that. i think i would map out i would often think to myself okay i want a piece i would kind of like map it out i want a piece 
Oh, I love how, say, Ed Jackson solos over the changes to confirmation. And I love it when the two, two saxes together solo over the changes for confirmation. But then what if we had the changes just start, we never play confirmation, but there's a set of changes and, but then the drums come in and out, in and out, maybe. Or um, um, or there's this pad of backgrounds, but they like dub. They come in, they come out, yeah. they come in, they come out. And then there's these very strange kind of um, um, melodies, but they're, they're like little fragments, basically. Then there's this, then there's that. But I'd kind of have the whole thing mapped out. This is what I want. I want this, 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 this. And yet the underlying structure is still the changes to confirmation. Um, and I'd kind of shape it from there. And then towards the end, I realizing, you know, this is crazy, but what I really want, I want the, the saxes to trade with the drums, but trade ones. So, do, 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 yeah. Yeah. and um uh, so that became the tune um martian affirmation i think i was like in a place where we often many of us are i feel like i'm from another planet and i'm gonna have to just accept that that's okay <laughs> it's okay to be from another planet um <laughs> that was beautiful. That yeah. <laughs> there was Maybe. other ones from that record that were also pretty out there the one on swimming there was one called samuel gets the call oh yeah and yeah from yeah. the bible god is going samuel samuel and um um samo he maybe should have been saying samo <laughs> samo and um um and then it started with that and then it went into this crazy beautiful ballad for tony yeah. like almost a ben webstery ballad but then i wrote this crazy mingus kind of shout chorusy thing um when tony was done and then it went back to the samuel samuel um so i basically made some kind of crazy arc arc with yeah with that often they're, they're kind of cinematic one could say yeah it oh is. my yeah. It's later than I thought. I, you, get me started, and I can't stop. Oh no! Please, uh, it, it, so we're it's, good. Oh, we're good. I mean, yeah, I can. I can talk more. Oh no, no, sure. We're, we're, it's, uh, not, it's not. We're not bound to one hour. Okay. Right, it's not, no, we're, no, no, please. It's, you, you just. It's. It, you know, I love listening to you. That's. That's mm. why, why you're doing this. So you know, it's. You have so much. You did so much stuff, and it's incredible. It's uh, when you're old. When you're quote old. You go look back and go, oh wait a minute, I did this and this and then this and then there was and then you just. <laughs> but speaking of bizarre ones, I have to ask you about this because I have the record, the Cactus of Knowledge with Robbie. Oh yeah, man, he... uh, like yeah. how did you cope with those uh, 17, 19 oh, cross six, eighteen right. uh, times two structures, and how did that happen? Actually, I mean that project. Not not easy. I think because I knew um, Matthias, the engine. Yeah producer um and rabbi wanted to have a mix of instrumentalists some um, jazz type yeah. folks and um and i think they really wanted two trumpets french horn tenor alto um trombone etc yeah. etc tuba um so once they had that Oh my, he came to New York and we rehearsed like crazy for like a whole week oh, every, day, every day. And it was, for me, it was hard. It was the, it was the back, the oompas. Like we would, you'd have to go, you know, you're doing, you're doing little oompas off beats, but in 1716 or something. But after a while, you just break it down, twos and threes, twos and threes, twos and yeah. threes. And it and it slowly and then you you kind of get it by hearing. You know who was really good at that? Ellery Escalin. Really, I wanted to ask you how Ellery. did Ellery do with that? Uh, really, he was amazing. Wow. he was just he really? was just like, okay, I think I got it. Okay, I got it. Um, wow. And I don't know whether it was thinking about it in twos and threes, or we would also say you just have to kind of hear it. You just have to feel that 
feel the baba da baba baba da baba baba da baba baba da baba da baba da baba 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 da and which one is uh 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 you know twos and threes twos and threes um Ellery was amazing um and Dave Ballou it was Dave Ballou and Eddie Eddie Allen and they were both great so that was really that was cool um wow those were fun we did at least two two tours with that are you toured also with that one i didn't know i thought it was just the yeah, record we recorded oh. and then we played in um i think we rehearsed in new york but we recorded in germany and then performed in germany oh, wow. and then about two years later or so we we also performed in england um, really? that's oh, we wow. played in like Oh, maybe they got a, one of those special grants. I'm not sure. We, we played in like Leeds, um, Brighton, Bath, uh, really? London, wow. um, Exeter. Oh, I remember Exeter. That was that was a cool one. Um, and maybe Germany also. And um, it was just like one of those many gigs in the... Now, that would have been early OOs, I think. Yeah, right? I think the record is 2001. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so that sort of general freelancing, playing in lots of different interesting groups, um, yeah. continued. Then, like I said, I moved to Seattle in 05 because it was like two kids. I've been here for 24 years. Maybe I, maybe it is time for a change up until then. I was like, no, no, never, never. And um, it was a really good change, though, I have to yeah. say. And there was, like, a great community here. I immediately, um, within two years, recorded for the next, or three years, I recorded for the my next project called Heaven and Hell with Fant- with Russ Johnson, the great trumpet yeah, player. I love Russ, yeah. And then the rest were basically Seattle folks who were just top-notch people who I still play with to this day in different situations. And then I did the next one, in oh well that was oh eight so then the next one i did in 2012 it seems like it was last week but it wasn't <laughs> i it's time i have some, some things in the cans that i'm ready to, to oh, yeah, i wanted um, to ask you about that yeah what, what, to do what, if, more if you're planning something new yeah so the the recent one was with one was with seattle folks where it was kind of um this one is called nine surprises mm-hmm, and it's it out. it's mm-hmm. out now I finally, because it's my own label, I can send you the band camp. Oh, please. I would love to. Band camp. My, I'm joining these crazy kids of today. Um, and um, um, <laughs> my, some of my former students are helping me. No, it's good. It's smart. Yeah. Uh, um, Wayne Horvitz once said, if you're, if you're stressed and just pay a student, pay a, or a former student who's a graduate, pay them to do it really it's like your life it's like oh my god that's such a good idea (laughs) so um there's so many great cornish college of the arts graduates out there there and a lot of them are in brooklyn a lot of them are in california a lot of them have are have stayed in um um stayed in seattle you know who else went to cornish i'm going to see him tonight brad shepik oh really say hi uh, say hi to brad please He's yeah. going to be with Jamie Baum, who is another dear yeah. friend that Good goes way, way back yeah. then. Um, really? But then oh, wow. um, Brigham Krauss, the sax player, he went to Cornish. Oh. And also um, Andy Laster went to Cornish. Man, yeah. Um, and Myra Melford. She, I don't know if she finished at Cornish, but she definitely went to Cornish. Oh, wow. Um, but this is back in the, I guess, 90, 80s yeah. and or 90s. Um, but it's a very small, plucky, crazy little place where it's, there's always problems, but we kind of just figure a way to, to move ahead. But the most re- recent one was w- with those, a lot of those folks called Nine Surprises. And it's more like, what if Gil Evans and Bach met for a beer and we're talking about, oh, how do we, how do we do this with our kids and our blah, 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 blah. And, um, and that came out of it. <laughs> oh, wow. It's like a, it for, this yeah. long suite with small s- other um, um, sections, and... sections, some little one minute interludes and some sections that are like, you know, eight, oh, nine, wow. 10 minutes. Um, I'll make sure you get the info for that one. Oh, please. Um, yeah, I, I will. Ch- I'll try to find it. Yeah. So 
so, but to bring us up to pretty much the present now, what I've been interested more in is, um, although I do mean to get back to more, much more detailed notated composition, but in the, in the last couple of years, I've been doing these projects with members of what is called the Seattle Phonographers Union. Oh. And a phonographer, what is a phonographer, you may ask? A phonographer is somebody that collects sounds. It might be, um, they're all field recordings. So it might, who, and then you realize it doesn't matter what it is. They use them as improvisational material. It might be, you know, crickets. It might be, yeah. um, my, my favorite is, um, uh, termites eating a wood a wooden pew in an old abandoned church man okay um, or it might who knows what it might oh. be old trains or industrial sounds and you can't tell so i will have two or three phonographers with their laptops and speakers set up in a big circle or semicircle and then i might have i've been doing more brass and percussion like five or six or seven <laughs> brass players and maybe wow. one percussion player who also plays brass and we just create these improvisations where it might be a muted trumpet tuba and those termites <laughs> and i recorded a project about two years ago a year ago and that i need to that i i'm in the process of you know mixing and editing and putting that out um, wow basically it's the project is called sound vespers because it was always performed it was almost feels like um a vespers concert like a compline like the sun is going down and it's very quiet and then you hear these the holy yeah. termites <laughs> oh beautiful so that i'm gonna do some more with um I love, you know, the, the concept of live improvisation with electronics, um, which I have never done as an electronic musician, but I've loved yeah. to do them as um, collaborators. Like the things that um, Evan Parker has done more recently, and not so recently, 10 years ago, yeah. with he would have um, um, Evans, like the Trump, the, the oh, virtue. Peter, Peter, Peter Evans. Peter, yeah. Peter Evans, yeah, yeah. Ned Rothenberg. Barry Guy, um, some of the the British, the Brits, and the Americans, and then um, Italian, some Italians, um, in this huge circle of like five electronics and five um, live instrument players, yeah. and those collaborations I've really been enjoying mm. and getting more into myself, things like that. But having said all of that. There's some great musicians here in Seattle and it's now time I need to get back to composing like something more similar to swimming, but yeah, the, next, the next um, chapter, would love it's, time for, yeah. it's, time, it's time for that. There's a fantastic tenor player here named Neil Welsh who plays mm -hmm. bass sax too. Wow. He's a couple few years ago, he put out a one minute improvisation every day for a year. Wow. And then he put it up on, um Man's on his for... web on his website oh well, okay really interesting and great player um and i want to do more he was on a concert just about two three weeks ago with me where we just did some improvisations and then we did a group of french horns like seven eight french horns came and joined us in this beautiful wow, sort man. of church space because it's julius watkins 100th birthday it would have been like a week ago today, actually. Wow. So, um, so I wanted to celebrate that. So I'm I'm keeping busy, and it's keeping also busy, just yeah. teaching teaching full time. But yeah. I get to teach um, pretty much in the way in which that I want to. I mean, I'll have these crazy mixed groups where there might be a violin and um, one trumpet, one sax, one uh, two guitars, and we'll just. Improvise um, and make some play. things we might improvise but then i'll have them do ellington and thelonious Monk oh, and, wow. yeah. um things like that so i'm really enjoying that as well yeah, in fact really what made me laugh i make this last week in a composition class where i made them all write pop songs with like intro verse verse chorus verse verse chorus bridge verse verse chorus out and some of them were like well 
I do that all the time. That's no big, <laughs> but some of them are like, how do I do it? So I, I laugh, I'm laughing at myself because yesterday I'm like, damn it, I better do this too. So I, I, it took, I sat down for a half an hour and wrote, wrote it in a half an hour. My example of a verse, pop verse, song. chorus, bridge, so, pop song. It, it sounds like my imagination. It's David Bowie singing with the cars. That's, that's the wow. concept. <laughs> <laughs> maybe i'll send it to you what the oh, other thing about the last as you know the last 18 months i wish i could say it, me but all my students so many of them and so many colleagues are getting very good at their ableton their yeah. logic yeah um the reaper ableton logic reaper yeah. and um so this my students are able to create these really uh interesting nice you know, entities. We're on their own. Also. Yeah. Right. Yeah, which is, important. which is much more the future. Yeah, um, I agree. And um, I'm, I need, that's another thing I've been meaning to do for the last 18 months and never did get to it because I was teaching full time all through Still, this yeah. pandemic. Wow. Um, it was a lot of it was zoom, but I never yeah, sure. stopped. It wasn't like, okay, see you in a year. It was like, okay, see you next week. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's good. Come and, on, that's good. Uh, well, that was good. Active. That yeah. was good. Yeah, yeah. stay sane totally. and keep sane. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so beautiful. Um, I should probably get going. Yeah, thank um, you so much, Tom, uh, for I'm sharing. Think, was there stuff. anything else? We didn't play any music, but maybe this is what happens. People just no, like, it's talk, okay. Talk, yeah, talk, talk. I, I love this. We, you know, it's. <laughs> Thank you.